we all experience states of positive subjective value and negative subjective value. What we might call pleasure and pain, I think more neutrally and generally could be termed positive and negative subjective value. This is indubitable because the qualitative nature of experience as presented phenomenologically is always indubitable. It simply is what it is to the mind as it appears. You can doubt things that you make reference to, but you can't doubt experience if it's not referring to anything else. I can doubt that what I'm seeing behind this camera is a chair uh, because it may be an illusion, but I can't deny the brown color as it appears to me that I'm seeing. I can't deny the shape that I'm seeing. I am seeing that shape. Uh, I may not be seeing what the actual physical object is. I might be hallucinating, but the qualitative nature of the hallucination is indubitable. So positive and negative subjective value is indubitable. Um, and so moral realism is true because that is a fact Positive and negative subjective value is a fact. If we define morality to be the dynamics of positive and negative subjective value, <clears throat> then clearly morality exists. Positive value exists. Negative value exists. There's dynamics of the two that operate independently of our arbitration. It occurs to us. It's presented to us. These Phenomena are as enmeshed in what we might interpret to be the causal nexus, given a few metaphysical presuppositions, as anything else. They don't pop into existence by magic, or at least we don't have any special reason to believe that positive and negative value do, but other things don't. It would be a form of special pleading to say that positive and negative value and their dynamics are not real if you say that thermodynamics is real. It depends on a subject to perceive it, but all physical systems depend on a subject to perceive it. The fact that it requires a subject, or even the fact that it's a mental phenomenon, does not imply that morality is not objective, i.e. it adheres to uh, constant patterns, or what we might term fixed laws. It's predictable. We can make truth claims about it. I can say that if I present you with a naked woman, aged 24, uh, in good health, in good shape, that you'll experience some kind of positive value. And that prediction would likely be correct. Uh, and so you can make truth claims about moral things. You can make moral truth claims and be objectively right or wrong with those claims. So I don't think that this is um, an unconventional definition of morality. If you do read the Nicomachean Ethics or even Plato, this is in essence the uh, the traditional position on ethics, on morality, that it has to do with um, maximizing the good and minimizing the bad. The good positive value definitely exists, the bad definitely exists, and there are things that we can do to maximize the good and minimize the bad. That's just a fact. And uh, we can be right or wrong regarding the claims that we make about it. Now, if we want to interpret an ought, people talk about the is-ought gap. If an ought simply means that if you follow my advice, you will experience more positive value, then if I say you ought to quit smoking, I can be objectively right or wrong, depending on what happens in, uh, in actual life. Because you might quit smoking, and recover your, uh, your health and feel better and experience more positive value. And in that case, I was right in saying you ought to quit smoking. I could say you ought to start doing heroin 
and uh, you could experience a lot of positive value immediately, and it might seem like I was right, but measured over the long term, I might end up being wrong. Uh, the, there is a measurement problem. So in principle, it's going to be right or wrong, but there is a problem where we can't necessarily measure over the, the long term. Uh, it would take necessarily a lifetime to ultimately measure the validity of any moral claim, any ought, because uh, life blends together. And if I say you ought to quit smoking, like maybe you quitting smoking has auxiliary effects in other regions of your life and uh, years later results in you like not meeting a fit partner for yourself and you end up alone and depressed. So, you know, there's kind of chaos in the background. But my claim will, at the end of the day, either be right or wrong, even if we can't necessarily measure whether I was right or wrong. And uh, the kinds of claims that we'll make also depend on our metaphysical and cosmological presuppositions. A Christian who believes that there is a God that has rules for us to follow and will punish rule breakers with hell and reward rule abiders with heaven uh, will want to follow those rules regardless of their impact on your subjective value in the here and now. So a Christian will say, have faith in Christ, uh, don't commit adultery, don't commit all these sins, because the long-term benefits of being in heaven infinitely outweigh the short-term benefits of experiencing pleasure here. Now, the Christian could be wrong in their metaphysical assumptions. There may not be a God. You might not have an afterlife, in which case their moral advice would be in fact wrong. Uh, but that still means that moral realism is true and not moral nihilism. So, that's the weakest claim, I think, that's sufficient to establish moral realism. I used to be a moral nihilist. I think it necessarily involves a form of special pleading. If you believe that anything is real or objective, then moral phenomena are real and objective. We can make predictions about them. We can be right or wrong. It's much harder to measure moral things than it is to measure uh, like thermodynamics. But that's, uh, that doesn't take away from the fact that our claims can be right or wrong in the moral domain. I think it's a fair definition of morality, uh, and I think it's evident that positive and negative value are real. So the interesting part comes when you start speculating uh, about the nature of the soul, the nature of the world, and uh, this is a hedonistic egoistic position, but if you make certain metaphysical assumptions, then it might lead to altruistic behavior. So, um, kind of incidentally, I did watch a debate, perspective philosophy, had a debate with some other person on YouTube about veganism, but they talked about uh, moral nihilism versus realism quite a bit. And what I disagree with in perspective, philosophy's perspective, is uh, that he goes from basically where I just got to, saying there is positive and negative value, we can make real predictions about these, um, to saying that without assuming that there is a God or assuming that there's, you know, the soul that's universal or a soul that's eternal, that uh, we can make moral claims like you ought to be a vegan without reference to what will ultimately be good or bad for you personally, because you ought to be concerned about the welfare of another. But I don't really see the force in that argument. Uh, he kind of arrives at it based on the fact that we assume that other, uh, the, you know, our interlocutors are other subjects, and so we establish this kind of intersubjective realm and depend on it to verify our epistemic claims, uh, but you can do that. You can talk to someone and use their input to uh, strengthen your confidence in your beliefs 
without even assuming that they're a subject. And you can totally objectify them, even if you do think they're a subject. You can manipulate them. There's no obvious consequence. I think where you jump from moral egoism, which is a moral realist position, to moral uh, or any form of altruism, uh, to do that involves necessarily some kind of uh, presupposition or belief about the world that implies that the welfare of the other concerns your own welfare. And that's where I would tend to go, but the reason I made this video is there may be a debate between myself and somebody else on YouTube, not perspective philosophy, although I'd be happy to debate him on what I just mentioned, um, but there may be a debate between myself and a moral nihilist, and I'm familiar with their position, they're not necessarily familiar with mine, so out of fairness to him, I thought I'd go ahead and spell out what I think is the weakest claim sufficient to establish moral realism. Let me know what you think, and uh, criticize my argument, tear it apart so that I can make a stronger one when the time comes to actually have this, uh, have this out. So, thank you for listening.